Howdy folks, today we're talking how to create awesome portraits in the studio and on location. Plus, we're going to dive into what it takes to build your own dream studio at home right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We've spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that is not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nuts, and if you're like me and you enjoy free podcasts and YouTube content, then you can become a supporter of the show by buying us a coffee over on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us create more exciting episodes for you. But of course, you're more than welcome to say no, no hard feelings at all. Just know that your support really does make a difference. Now, without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest. Give it up for the portrait and real estate magician, the man who built an incredible studio right by his house, and a great buddy of mine, all the way from Memphis, Tennessee. Give it up for Mr. Bob Pierce. Bob, how's it going, man? Okay, it is so good to see you, brother. I, I got to tell everybody how I met you because it's such a great story. Um, Kay is involved with a, with a fantastic photo workshop over in Norway with, uh, with Dave Williams. And I heard about it through our mutual friend, David Bergman, who called me saying, Hey, you want to go, you're, you're really into landscape photography. Why don't you go do this, this, uh, this workshop, this Northern Lights workshop with me. And I'm like, sure, let's go do it. So we went, you know, didn't really know exactly what I was getting into. But I am not kidding. Within seconds of getting off that plane, uh, first of all, Dave and Kirsty were at the airport waiting for us, which I thought was an incredibly nice gesture. Um, and gave us gave us a ride back. But Kay and I just hit it off immediately. We have very similar uh, backgrounds. Um, Kay, if, I'm sure most of y'all know this, but if you don't, is a world class uh, musician, guitar player. And I am not a world-class musician, but I've been in the music business for about 25 years, was a songwriter in Nashville, and then owned a recording studio here in Memphis for about almost 25 years. Uh, so he and I just hit it off immediately. Uh, so it's great to see you. It's great to catch up with you, brother. I uh, hope we can hope we can hit the Northern Lights again sometime. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was a phenomenal experience. It was so much fun. What was your like? What was your uh, impression the first time you saw the Northern Lights? Being from the states and being from the southern part of the states, where you, you obviously you don't ever see the Northern Lights, I knew precious little about it. Uh, I, I, for instance, I did not realize that they're not on just all the time. I mean, it's I, I kind of um, put it sort of like people who are storm chasers or or people who are trying to capture pictures of lightning. You might sit out there for, for weeks and never get the lightning, uh, but when you get it, it's amazing. Well, that's kind of, it's not quite that obscure with, with the lights, but they're not on all the time. And even when they do show up, you might only have a minute or 30 seconds or, or two hours. You just never know. They're, they're all over the place, but it's, it is one of those things that you really can't describe. I mean, describe salt, the taste of salt. You can't do it. it the Northern Lights are so amazing and so i mean it's horizon to horizon it's just really is an amazing an amazing thing to see and if if anybody's interested in doing it dave and kirsten are the guys to go do it with the the, the amount of knowledge these two guys have about it is, is phenomenal uh, and then they're just cool they're cool guys they're fun hangs uh you know fun to go to the bar at night and have a drink with them Kirsten will probably love you if you bought him a rum and coke. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's great. One hundred percent. I just I highly recommend it. There you go. Hold on, hold on. Cheers, my brother. Cheers. Oh, cheers, man. <laughs> Predominantly, yeah, it was good times. It was good times. I mean, you know, I enjoyed. Um, obviously, I enjoyed the uh, the Northern Lights. And I, uh, enjoyed yeah. teaching the, the workshops and everything. But um, there's such a social element to it as well, which was just you know absolutely phenomenal. Um, and well, I, you're, I have to you're say, together 24 hours a day for, for yeah. what was it, a week? A week, wasn't it? You quickly realize whether you're going to get along or not. And I think we, we got so lucky because everybody on the trip, uh, Paul, David Berkman, I mean, everybody was such a good hang. 
good to hang out with uh, our models. I don't know if, I, I think Dave's still doing the model aspect of it. Uh, not only do you shoot the urban lights, but you also, there's also a whole other element to the, to the workshop where you're doing portrait photography with um, Viking models. And when, when David told me about that, I was like, ah, I don't really know if I'm involved in, in, in the Viking model thing. I really worship in the landscape and the, uh, the northern lights. Uh, and I was 100% wrong. Uh, the Vikings, first of all, the, the two models they had were, were great, beautiful, and super nice, great to be around. Um, but the, you know, when you, like, for instance, when you go to, say, Florida in the United States, basically, if you look towards the ocean, it's beautiful. If you turn around the other way, probably not going to be all that exciting. And I'm sure people from Florida get mad at me for that. But in general, uh, in Norway, it doesn't matter which direction you look. It's freaking amazing. I mean, look east, look west, look look south. It's beautiful everywhere you look. Um, so everywhere you look, you've got portrait potential. I mean, just potential. I remember, I remember being really mad at you guys. You guys were driving us to the airport to leave, and we're, we're leaving the, the little town. I can't pronounce the name of the town. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Savnoy, I think. I think. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. What do what you say? What is it? I can't do it. When, when you leave the town about, it's probably technically still in the town, there's a church there right up against the base of a, of a mountain that is just stunningly beautiful. And I'm like, why didn't you see a picture of this? This is beautiful. I mean, but that's the problem is everywhere you look. I mean, you can't drive 15 feet without going, well, that would be a great spot. Let's just stop right here. I mean, everywhere you look, it's, it's phenomenal. I remember there was one, one day where we were driving back from somewhere and we thought we were driving and, and I sort of I turned my head and I remember saying to Dave, like, hey, let's stop here. Let's get out. And that that's, looks like a great backdrop. You know, it looks like a great location to take some pictures. And so we got out and it was one of these things where, you know, it didn't matter which way you turn. You turn one way, amazing landscape. You turn the other way, an amazing landscape. You turn, you know, turn around, amazing mountain. It was just like, okay, well, you can create so many images just in this one spot, you know. There you've got the fjord, like the sea with some mountains in the background. There you've got mountains, there you've got rocks. It's, you know, it's amazing. I think we spent quite a long time in this, in this one location and we get so many different images just by turning one way or turning another way. It's just nuts. So, uh, yeah, it was... What, it what was, was interesting about that, I know the exact location you're talking about. Uh, what was interesting about that is you had, you know, you've got a van full of, of either professional or um, heavy activists, you know, uh, people who are really into photography to see which direction people headed to go, well, this is what caught my eye. This is what caught David Bergman's eye. This is what caught your eye. I mean, everybody's kind of going in different directions um, because everybody had different visions of, of what they thought would make a cool picture. Yeah, um, exactly. To me, exactly. that was that was interesting to sit back and watch just everybody kind of go, well, you know, I didn't, like I know Paul had a, a, a location once and I'm just going to go, I would have thought of that, but he's right. That's a that's a good location, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just going to say this, for those for those of you listening or watching on YouTube, um, the internet is not our friend today. So <laughs> you know, just stick with it. Um, it's there's a lot of interference going on. Um, I, don't, I had a guy a knock on my door earlier today to tell me that they're testing some uh, some lines outside or something. No idea, but anyway. So you know, just stick with it. It'll be fine. Um, anyway, so yeah, so uh, Norway was a phenomenal experience. Um, it was so much fun. Um, Definitely to be repeated at some point. Uh, but whilst we were in Norway, I remember, you know, we were talking and you were telling me that you were building out um, your own studio in in your place. And I thought, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And then, But then when we went back home, I remember we were like talking on FaceTime and you showed me uh, the studio as it was sort of in mid-build, basically. You know, and I thought, wow, this looks incredible. We're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to do an episode once the studio is finished. Because I really want to talk to you about, first of all, the whole process that you went through um, as far as building your own studio is concerned and, you know, what that looked like and how you how you came up with it and all the all the stuff that you put in it. Because I think a lot of people out there are going to be thinking, yeah, it'd be amazing to have my own studio. How can I do that? 
Um, so wh- first of all, where did you get the idea from to build your own studio? And what was the, it, the initial sort of thought process? What was that like? Well, I, I'm giving you a little, just a little bit of background. Um, I know when I watch like Adorama or b h we're going to teach you how to do a portrait today. And they always have some size to Hooters model, beautiful girl. They're going, well, it's not going to be hard to take a beautiful portrait of her because she's already just beautiful. You need to get somebody, you need to, they, they, here's an idea for you, person. You need to do a whole series of how to do portraits of average or ugly people because that's what, because I'm what I call a grunt photographer. I'm out there. I'm not shooting, you know, the A-list celebrities. I'm not shooting the, the beautiful people. I'm out there. Uh, I am a professional. It is what I do to make a living. But I'm shooting just average, normal stuff, whatever it is so to I, make I, a I, living. I just need to check there for a second, though, because because he, I've 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 seen your portfolio, and I have to say, if that is, you know, if that's the Tennessee average look, then then you don't want to know what good-looking people look like in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh God! Well, obviously, I'm I'm going to be putting the the cream of the crop in my portfolio. But yeah. uh, you know, when you're when you're when you're a headshot photographer and you're going into a corporation and you're going to shoot, say, fifty headshots over the next two days or three days, you're going to have a couple of nice looking folks. But you're going to get a lot of people who look like me. You know, you're just like, oh gosh, kind of scary. Um, so, but that you got to do what you got to do. Um, but so a, a lot of what I do is, is real estate photography. And if, if you're interested in going into a really incredible, boring type of photography, go into real estate photography. It's, it's dry as it can be, but it's very, very steady. Uh, I work uh, during the, the busy seasons. I work seven days a week. I might shoot anywhere from four to six hours a day. Uh, today is not the busy season, but I still shot two houses today and this morning before I came to do this. Um, it's very, very busy. So I do a lot of that. Uh, and I, I am getting to your question, I promise. Um, but I've got, a, uh, just in my house, I had a, a spare bedroom that I made a little photo studio out of. Uh, and it was a room that was maybe 12 foot by 10 foot, maybe, give or take, uh, with... Here in the states, the, the the average ceiling height is usually between seven and eight feet. Probably mine was probably eight feet tall. Um, I don't know what that is in, in meters, um, but you know, but it was very small. It was a very small confined space. Really, you could only kind of do a, a torso up. That's really about all you could do, uh, unless you wanted to really get creative and then also be willing before AI. Uh, spend a lot of time in Photoshop, you know, fixing all the, the sides and the ceilings so because you're going to see, if you pull back too far, you're going to see light stands or whatever. So um, I had wanted to build my own studio because I'm old enough that I don't want to have to drive somewhere to go to work. I just, I wanted to do, be the convenience of being able to just step out and do it. And I had a storage building uh, that was maybe 15 by 20 or whatever. Uh, um, and it was full of just what you would expect your typical storage building to be full of lawnmowers and art supplies, just stuff. When then you know, if you lived in a house for 25 years, you just got stuff. And, um, it was January 2nd of last year. Uh, it got struck by lightning and it, it no. burned to the ground. I mean, it was the scariest thing ever. I was out there with a, my little water hose. And I quickly realized the, the hose wasn't affecting the fire at all. But I, I was hosing down my deck and the side of my house to keep it wet. And the fireman said that that probably saved the house, just keeping that 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 area nice and, and soaked, uh, kept the fire from spreading because it was bad. Uh, it burned to the ground. And so then I was like, well, I'm, I've am i got to do something. And I, I want a new studio. So I tried to find contractors to, to build this new studio for me, and none of them would do it because they were all saying, you know, it's too small a job. We've got so much big stuff going on. We're not willing to pull our guys off. And then I would talk to the, the little, you know, one guy, two-man shop. And they were kind of going, well, we can build a garage, but my backyard has a pretty good slope to it. So we're going to have to bring in a fair amount of dirt. 
And we don't we don't feel like we know how to do that. That that's above above our knowledge base. So I kept complaining. One of my best best friends is the president and owner of a large commercial construction company. He's yeah, I'm tired of hearing me bitch about it. He goes, all right, I'm going to build this damn studio for you because I'm tired of hearing you talk about it. But the deal is, we you, you can't put a time frame on because I'm going to pull my guys off to come frame it. It might be a day <laughs> or six weeks before I can come do the insulation or do the side or do the whatever it is. So you can't put a time frame on it because, you know. So I said, that's fine. So they ended up doing that. They brought seven dump trucks full of dirt to, to build that, uh, to fill in the dirt, to make it level. Uh, and then we had to bring the concrete in and for, pour a foundation, the footings, the whole thing. So the whole process did take probably four to six months to, to do the whole thing. Obviously, if they had just worked on it solid, they probably could have done it in two weeks. But but that was the situation that we had. Uh, but the beauty of it for for me as a photographer, uh, I, I built it technically to be a garage. So it, it, it has a header above the front door. So if somebody were to buy this, if I were to sell it, they could knock the front wall out uh, and put a garage door in it. There's like, say there's a header built so that that, that wouldn't be a problem. I had it wired ele electrical electricity so that there's a, a plug up on the ceiling. So you could put your garage door over there. So it would be a, to be a garage would be very, very simple. But for me, it's a photo studio and it, uh, the, the, the selling point is as a photographer, uh, it does have 12 foot ceilings, which is a, a big deal as other photographers would, would all obviously already know that. Um, you got to get those lights up high. Uh, so having 12 foot ceilings was a, is a big plus for me. Um, but also you of all people would appreciate this. When I built it, it's this big rectangle with parallel walls and a concrete floor. Oh my God, it just sounded awful in here. I mean, it sounded just nothing but echo. So then I had to figure out what am I going to do acoustically to make it where you can at least be able to hear on a conversation without your ears hurting because of the echo going back and forth. So I brought in some some different, uh, having been in the recording studio business for 25 years, I was able to use some of that knowledge and brought in some um, some diffusion and some absorption. As Kay would know, you need the combination of both. Uh, you don't want it totally dead. And it's still fairly live in here, but it's it's very doable now. I've got some stuff on the ceiling, some stuff strategically placed on the walls. Um, and at some point, we might take the camera and show you, but I've got some, some different headshot stations that the material is actually acoustic material used to diffuse sound, but it's cool looking. So I'm using it as a headshot station, but also it's helping diffuse the sound. And then also, as as photographers do, we can put gels on lights and throw the colors onto it to really make it more interesting. So that's nice. And the other the other big deal about the studio besides the 12 foot ceilings. I did put in a hard side wall or a seamless wall. I had the, the studs or the ribs custom made. I, I, there's a company that, that does this. You send them the, the dimensions of what you want and they actually make the curved um, studs that then get uh, installed. And then that was the one area where I was telling my, my, my friend, the contractor, I said, you know, you can get me whoever is available to do the paint and the framing and the this and the that. But when it comes to the sheetrock, I need your A call. I need, I'll wait weeks and weeks to get your best sheetrock guy. Because he's going to have to come in. He's going to have to bend sheetrock and curve it. Um, and he goes, I, I got just the guy for that. I got just the guy. In fact, the guy was so, was so confident and cocky, we told him to use quarter-inch sheetrock. He came in and said, now my guys are so good, we're going to use half inch. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So he used it. So he bent half an inch sheetrock. And I'll, I'll show you, it's, it's absolutely amazing how good this guy was uh, at bending it.
Um, it caused a little bit of problem later because of the flooring where it, when it meets the floor, um, instead of being that little tiny quarter inch, there's a half inch gap. We took took another extra bit of work to solve that problem, but we finally solved it. Um, so it's 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 been great. I, it's it's only been finished for about a month now, or give or take about a month. Uh, I've done one fashion shoot. I think I sent you one of the pictures. I don't know if you want to fly that in at some point. Um, of a girl that we worked out perfect. She's a fashion design major, University of Memphis. She also happens to be a model. She's stunningly beautiful, but also she, but she made these dresses, and she needed a place to go have them photographed for her portfolio for school. And I. I needed uh, somebody to test my new studio out, so I was like, great. It's a win-win for both. So brought her in, and it was a great, uh, the studio worked great. I mean, obviously, I would love for it to be a little bit bigger. It uh, It's about, I think it's 15 feet wide, and I think it's 25 feet long, if, I'm, if I remember right. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's decent size. It's, it's not, obviously, it's not big enough as a, be a quote commercial photography studio but it's certainly big enough to do stuff that i'm going to be doing and stuff i do is going to be headshots uh some some product stuff um small small family type shoots and then model and fashion stuff so it's for that it's perfect it's got um plenty of room for that i've got plenty of you know all the different light modifiers stuff you can you can Thank God. So it, it's good to go there. And it's, it's been, uh, so far it's been great. I love it. When, when are you going to come shoot you? Okay. Oh, I will definitely, I'll be hopping over there uh, next year. I think that's, come uh, on, man. that's, come on. that's my plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's definitely the plan, I think. Um, but I tell you what, this is actually, it's an interesting thing you mentioned and, uh, that's, that's got to do with, um, you know, being realistic about what you can actually shoot in your, in your studio. So, you know, you mentioned you started out by just having a studio set up in your spare bedroom, for example. And I think, you know, a lot of people um, start out like that. You know, in fact, only today I spoke to a friend of mine who's basically just rearranging one of his spare bedrooms into a studio. And he was asking me about, you know, how do I, you know, how, how do I do this? And he came up with some really great ideas. He had, he's, he's got this uh, this rail system, like this, this these tracks on the ceiling. And so he can hang things off of there. And I thought... You know, that's great because when you're working in a small space, and I know this because my studio, my home studio is tiny. You know, it's actually just over there. <laughs> you know, um, and the one thing that's, you know, that is really an issue sometimes is when you've got lots of stands up, for example, you know, stands actually take up a lot of floor space, you know, when you open them up. And so when you're in a small space, you constantly, you end up having to climb over stands and then you might bump into something and it's, it's a pain in the neck. And so he came up with this idea of actually hanging things like, you know, flags or reflectors off of these these rails on the ceiling so that there's no footprint on the floor. So you can actually, although it's a small space, you can you can move through it relatively easily, which I which I thought was a brilliant idea. You know, so it's just about it's just about coming up with these with these solutions. But it's also, you know, as you said, it's it's about being realistic of what you can shoot. Like in my space, for example, um, I know it's absolutely fine for headshots three quarter shots no problem i can get a full length shot in of a single person really you know maybe a couple but that's about it so large groups not gonna happen you know um but i know that and so that's what my studio is being used for is is what i can realistically achieve in there and you know because i know that it's quite a comfortable space um this also, I mean, it, the wall behind. Just tell me about the wall uh, that you're sitting in front of, because that is um, that's a very cool little feature in your studio. Hey, let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode, Platypod. Platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity. With their stable, versatile, and portable solutions, you can capture stunning shots like never before. And I'm not just saying that. As the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypod's incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypod products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. 
Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. Uh, I think it's Manfrotto makes an auto poll. It's just a poll that you can raise up and it, it hits the ceiling and then there's a, a locking mechanism that locks it tight. So then you've got just one pole that's maybe three inches in diameter that then you can take a magic arm with a, with a super clamp and put lights to it, but so there's very little um, Ooh, floor space being being taken up by a sand, like with lead, like a like a secret amp or something. Uh, auto poles were the best thing ever for a small studio. Uh, I I think it's Manfrotto. Other manufacturers may make them too. I'm not sure, but that's a great thing that you might want to mention to your friend. That in fact, I use it. So I'm going to use it here for when I want a a, a kicker light, a hair light. Uh, but it's a fairly wide shot, and I don't want to spend all day photoshopping out light stands. I'll just put the auto pole up because uh, it just takes up such a small amount of space. Um, it's a great thing. Back to your question. This is this is one of the headshot stations, um, but it's actually uh, it's also a diffusion material that's helping with the sound. And what's cool about this stuff is it's PVC pipe. It's the plastic piping they use in uh, plumbing. It's made. This is made out of the same type of plastic. Um, and what's cool about this is it's paintable. So if you wanted to to put this up and paint it, you know, purple or something, you can. Obviously, I like it white because I can just throw a gel on the light and make it whatever color I want. Um, and I like the the white to good neutral and stuff. But um, that that's one of the headshot stations I've got. And then above that, up on the on the very top, I've got four different rolls of you know, Savage photo paper that I can roll down and and, and change if I want just a, a straight background. Um, but this stuff is like say and it's it's just on Amazon uh, as an acoustic um, diffusion material for studios. Um, and I I was looking for some I, I knew I knew about Sonex and Oral X I knew about all those obvious stuff but I I was looking for something that might be more of a diffusion material as opposed to an absorption material. And I found that and I immediately liked the gold. That make a great place to do headshots or portraits. Just, you know, something different than just a standard paper backdrop. So that's what that is. And then there's another material on the other side. Especially in a small studio, it's really important that everything in the studio, every feature, every background is sort of multi-purpose because because there's not necessarily the space to like move in lots of different, you know, different backgrounds and stuff. So it's, it's always important to, uh, to, you know, get maximum bang for the buck in whatever you do. Like for instance, in my little studio, I mean, it's so small that um, I have, I usually have a, a backdrop set up. Um, and when I do a headshot session, I say, if I want to switch to white, I have a white wall that is just basically adjacent to the to the backdrop. So what I'll do is I'll just turn around and I, I put the subject or the client or the model in front of that white wall. That becomes my white background. So rather than having to pull up a white paper background or whatever, um, I'll just flip them around. I, um, my light's usually on a C-stand with wheels. So I just wheel that thing and we're ready to shoot in like two minutes without me having to set up because I haven't got the space to have different... So on one hand, I don't have the space to, to have different uh, backdrops set up at the same time, but I also um, don't have on one side of my studio, I don't have uh, the height to have, um, you know, these background, uh, what you call it, roller systems, you know, set up because it doesn't go high enough. So it's a, my, my studio is a weird shape. On one side, it's a very high ceiling. It's about 10 foot, something like that tall. But on the other side, it goes down to about, what would that be? Uh, seven foot, I guess, maybe. Yeah, maybe it's 12 foot on one side. So it's like, you know, it's a, it's, there's a lot of space on one side, but it's great to get the lights up high. But on the other side, where the backdrop is usually, it's, it, I mean, it could be higher, if you know what I mean. You know, but that's, that's just what it is. So you just have to 
live within the limitations of the space, you know. But uh, but the sidewall is perfect for just a white backdrop. Or if I have to gel it, for instance, I can gel it. But usually, you know, it works really well. It, it's slightly textured. It, it's got a really light texture on it as well, which I like. Because you can do these sort of shots, you know, where somebody's leaning against the wall. And, um, you know, the typical, the kind of one light type of portraits where you have some shadow going across the wall. You get a little bit of texture in there as well. Actually, you know, it works really well for that. Um, yeah. So, well, I, I, I did something real similar um, for the, the psych wall or the seamless wall. Um, so, you imagine a, a rectangle has got four walls. So, two of my walls are white, um, but my other two walls, instead of using gray, you know, uh, seamless paper, I just took a sample of the paper to the paint store and had to match it. And so, those walls are just painted gray. So if, if a lot of my corporate headshots, that's what they want. They want a standard gray background, just very, very, you know, very, very business conservative headshot. So I just painted the walls gray for that and then did that with the ceiling. Um, I didn't want, obviously in a photo studio, black ceiling is great if you don't want light bouncing, but it also makes it things dark and it's just kind of, dreary and depressing so my, my yeah. ceiling is actually also that that neutral kind of gray car gray you've got to maximize every inch of space um for uh, to get as much bang for your buck uh, so that's exactly why i did that and that's the beauty of having the taller ceilings is being able to put i've got i've got 12 different colored papers uh in different spots uh with my roller systems that I can just easily roll down and roll back up um, to get as much I, as I can. And then, as you were saying, put a gel on a light, you can make anything. So, small studio spaces, you know, come with their own sort of unique um, troubles almost. Yeah. W one of the things, like in my studio, is everything's white. Like the ceiling's white, all the walls are white, it's all white, 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 which, you know, because it's sort of a semi living space as well, it's it works. You know, the problem that you have with that. And of course, I know that because I know that space very well because I shoot in that a lot. Um, of course, you get light bouncing all over the place. So you're going to have to control that. So I have to work with flax a lot um, that I, I wouldn't have to do that if I was if I were in, in a larger space, you know. But as it happens, when I'm, when I'm, let's say when I'm doing a headshot, that white sidewall automatically becomes a white reflector whether I want that or not. You know, so if I want to create some deeper shadows, I'm going to have to work with flax because I'm going to have to block the light reflecting back from that from that wall. So this can come in handy, or it can be a real pain in the neck, depending on what it is that you want to achieve. Um, and uh, although, although I would love to paint that wall gray, I think my wife would probably <laughs> have something to say about that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's one of these things. But it, it, you know, ultimately, to me, it's one of these things. You know, you as a as a photographer, you just adjust to the space that you're in, um, and to try and and maximize. You say you know, try and maximize whatever you can, um, and get the best out of that space. And you know, and then of course, as as you've explained earlier, you know, you started out in your spare bedroom, and then you figured, okay, well, you know, the next step would be to build. A purpose, you know, a purpose-built space that allows you to do additional things. That's that's the beauty of it, really. So, what what do you use for flags? Because I, I'm just lazy enough that I just use my V flaps uh, typically when I want to, you know, because it comes with a white and a, and a black side, and it's, they're so easy to set up and move around and light. Uh, yeah, I I've, I've thought about buying some some dedicated flags, but then I'm like, oh hell, is this. The B-flat no. works so, it's so easy. V-flats are beautiful, absolutely. Um, I use a lot of black poster board. Um, you know, these things come in, um, I don't know what the sizes are. What are these sizes? We call them A1 and A2 sizes. So they're pretty big boards. So you can, um, yeah. And you know, what I very often do is I, I just clamp one of those to a, to a light stand. And then, you know, I'll move that in and out. Um, depending on where I need it, because very often, I mean, especially when I'm doing um, head and shoulder portraits, you know, maybe three quarter shots or just straight up headshots, I don't necessarily need a, a full size six foot, seven foot, whatever V flat. I just need a relatively small piece of cardboard, you know, or, or a black poster board, 
to act as a flag for that particular part of it. You know, so it it really passes. The, the one thing I like about poster board is that it's so easy to, um, you know, to cut that up and and shape it and stuff like that. Um, I use that stuff for absolutely everything. Uh, yeah, and it's cheap. Yeah, and so I use that for a good example is. I have when we built so my my little uh, studio is is um, in an extension to the house which we built about maybe four years ago right so we extended the house out um, and that became it was meant to be a dining area but now it's my studio sort of thing um, and at the time we thought it was a really good idea to put a skylight there and now that is the bane of my existence because that damn skylight it it's such a, you know. I have to block, basically I have to block it out. I mean, the, you know, so when it's overcast, which luckily, well, I say luckily, which which it is most of the time in the UK, that is not so much of a, of a problem. But I can guarantee you, when I have a headshot client booked in, there'll be clear blue skies and there'll be a light beam from that, you know, coming through that skylight directly onto my backdrop, of course, you know, because it that's what we call sorts law. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so, so I have to block that thing off. And, um, have you had any leakage problems with it? Not at all. No, no, it's fine. It's like, uh, it's a, what do they call it? It's like a Velux window that they're, they're super damn tight. But, um, the problem with it is it's like one of these, um, skylight windows, you know, that you could open as like a mechanism using can open the whole thing. And, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty good, I mean, as far as a window is concerned, it's, it's pretty damn good. The, the problem is had I thought about it at the time. And I thought like, okay, I'm going to use this space as a photo studio. Then I would have just not had that thing put in because actually it was quite expensive to put that in, you know, and, and now I hate the thing. But, um, but you know, and, and really one day I need to get like a blackout blind for it. You can get these, uh, these custom made blinds that basically, you know, fit in. You can just close it. I have to really have that done at some point this year. But so far what I've been doing is I've cut out um, a piece of black poster board which literally I get out on a ladder and I, I put it on top of the skylight because you can swivel the window in and then I shut it and then it's then it just covers the, the skylight from the top and then there's obviously, I, you know, I get around that problem and then when the, when the client's gone, I have to go back up there and take it back out. Um, it's, you know, it is what it is. Had I known, had I thought about it at the time, then, you know, I would have just had them build the roof without a, without a window in it, but, you know, what can you do? That's, Live in a large... Yeah, you live alone, and and you know it's just it's all these things. You know, you when when you start using a space as a studio, um, you're gonna have to make some adjustments to make that work sometimes. So whether that means blacking out a window, for example, you know, whether it means um, moving things around, you know, um, at, or in my case, you know, I used to have uh, because of the limitations of space. I used to I when I first you know so I bought some I bought some studio strobes. And initially, I thought, oh, man, I need to get relatively small lights because if I'm limited in space. So if I, you know, if I get lights like standard lights that are about like this long or something, then they're gonna stick this far out from the ceiling, uh, from the from the wall. So it make gives me even less space. And so I thought, like, what I really want is like, do you remember these old alien bees that are like, it's like a little cube basically. And I kind of thought that's cool because the form factor is smaller. I can get them closer to the wall, you know. And then it gives me a little bit more space when I put a softbox on it. Um, and so I found these things by a company called Interfit um, that made these studio strobes that were literally the same shape as the old Alien Bees. So I ran those for, I don't know, maybe five. Maybe five. How long ago did we have to build? Well, five, yeah, maybe five years ago we had to build, before the pandemic. So I guess, yeah, so I ran those for about four and a half years or something. Until I got to the point where they just became too unreliable, and I had to, I had to switch over to uh, to different lights. But um, but you know sometimes you just have to make adjustments based on based on the location that you shoot in. And of course, I mean that's true no matter whether we're talking about you know a home studio or that we're talking about a location shoot or you know uh, any sort of a thing. You just have to be flexible and make the best out of the space that you're in. Ultimately, you you learn so much about lighting because it's it's. Um... It's so when you're in a studio, it's so precise about what you know how light was going to behave and what's going to happen. Um, and it's it's interesting to see the difference between you know uh, uh, a smaller beauty dish versus a 
70 inch umbrella or whatever, just the difference that the, the lighting characteristics have. Um, it's, it's so, it sticks out, at least to me, it sticks out so much more in studio. I don't know if other people have had that experience, but, uh, but I know that's true for me. When I first started out 10, 15 years ago, I would take so much crap with me just because I want to make sure I had every base covered. Now I'm like, oh, I could probably do that with just a, an AD 200 and a, you know, a little, a tiny little, you know, softbox, whatever. I, I'm sure I can make something work out of that. I just want to travel as light as I possibly can. But sometimes you have no choice but to take a lot of stuff. But that's the beauty of having a studio is it's all right here. I mean, if you want, don't want a big ass light source, well, I, I've got it. I've got a big light source or if I wanted to go with a, a hard light, I can do a hard light here. So that doesn't, that does make it nice having a studio. And also, of course, you can practice different things. You know, you can you can really get better because you can really get in there and and use this. You know, um, try out different things, experiment. You know, learn really learn um, how different modifiers work in your space as well. And this is always, I think, you know, for me, that's actually really important. I know my little space really well, so I know how it reacts. So if I think, you know, if I look at an image, I kind of go, "Oh, okay, I want to like, I don't know, recreate this particular lighting pattern or something." I pretty much know how that works in my space because I've shot in there so much, you know, um, whilst, you know, in other, in bigger spaces it might be might be more of a problem. I tell you, one, one of the things that's, that's happened not too long ago, actually, was, um, I was in a, um, I was in a, I was in a, I was doing a studio shoot in a pretty big studio that were like, there were a couple of other photographers um, as well. We all had like, it was like almost like a hangar size, like it's a big, big building. Um, and so. And we, we, we had our little setups each and I remember one of the guys coming over and he was like, why, why are you putting your lights so close? Like, what is the, what's the thing? Like you've got all this space. And I'm like, you know, I haven't thought about this, but this is how I shoot at home. I'm just used to, you know, I'm just used to not having a lot of space. So consequently my thinking is always, you know, I get things in closer. Um, whilst of course, if you're used to a larger space, you, you don't make, you make more use of that. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just what you're, what you're used to. And I, I think ultimately that can sort of build your own style as well, you know, depending on, on the space that you're shooting in. It just, Kevin, you just wanted a softer light. You just wanted softer light stories. That's all. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I didn't think about the fact that I could actually, you know, make more use of the space, but how has like building your own studio, um, how is that, what kind of impact has that had on your, on your business, for example? Well, it has a. I haven't had it open long enough to quote have an impact. I am. Uh, I, I utilize social media, Facebook and, and Instagram, uh, a fair fair bit to advertise my business. And once I put out that I, I have the studio, I have been getting uh, a fair amount of calls from people with the new year wanting to update their headshots. Um, so I, um, I'm anticipating, and I was planning on, I had a couple of headshots scheduled for a week ago but we had a, a freakish cold snap where it got um, down like zero degrees, which is, what would that be in, in Fahrenheit versus Celsius, whatever that would be. Uh, it got just crazy cold. And we had, I don't know, four to six inches of snow. And I, a lot of places, four to six inches of snow is not a big deal. But in, in, in Memphis, in the South, we're not prepared for that. We, the, the city doesn't have, you know, trucks and salt and, and they, they, you know, so the, basically the city just shuts down. I mean, so there was a week of just no work. I, I got so tired of Netflix. Um, so that, and then I've, I've had, a, I've had one or two people contact me about doing some boudoir stuff, which will be, this will be a, a good studio for that, um, that type of work. So we'll see if, how that goes. Um, haven't really had any corporate clients contact me yet, but like I say, it's only been open for about, only had it open for about a month. Uh, so, and then, you know, part of that was the holidays, Christmas, New Year's, all that stuff. So not much stuff goes on. So business, at least here in the States, is kind of just now kicking back into full gear uh, for the for the new year. So uh, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it, it, it it's a, turns into a, a pretty, healthy chunk of my uh photography is, is studio stuff uh because i certainly put enough money into building it um 
uh, I hope that it can pay for itself. So if nothing else, besides the obvious tax write-off, but, um, but also part of it is just for fun. I mean, I, part of it, I just, I love photography. I, I love it. Uh, and it's fun to experiment, try things. Uh, I'll see something on, on YouTube or, or something and go, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try. I'm going to see what that's like. I can see what, if I can replicate that style uh, or maybe change it, tweak it a little bit. But I love it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the gear that you've got in your studio. So, you know, we've uh, we've had a look at uh, the way you build it. We talked about how you build it and um, and the difference of stations that you've got there. But what kind of gear are you running in the um, in your studio? What's, what's your lighting setup like? So the lights I use, I use all Flashpoint uh, Godox stuff. Uh, I've got, I don't know, five or six AD 200s. I've got an AD 400 and an AD 600. And then I actually have a, a, an AD 1200, uh, which is certainly overkill for this, but I, I originally bought it because I was shooting uh, some architectural stuff for Hilton hotels and was having to go in and light, you know, big conference rooms, big, big spaces. And so I needed uh, some light for that. But I actually, I like it in the studio um, because of the faster recycle time um, and the battery last, you know, forever because I'm shooting at such a low, I mean, I'm never shooting it at one-to-one -one power in the studio. I'm shooting it at 132nd or, or 64th, maybe 128th. So the battery will last forever before I have to, you know, recharge it. Um, but everything else, like say, is the 200s, like most of my kicker lights are, uh, you know, 80 200s are, are, are plenty powerful enough uh, especially in a, in a studio this size, uh, between that or the 400 or the 600. Uh, oh, I also have a couple of, uh, of the, what do they call them? Streak like 360s, uh, that I bought right before the 8200s came out. And I was mad because the 200s are, are pretty much close to the same. What is that? And the 8200s are so versatile and, and light. Oh. I love them. So, uh, and then I've got, I don't know, I don't have any different soft boxes. I'm sort of a collector of, of that kind of stuff. I've got a, quite a large collection of different soft boxes, strip boxes, a, a pretty fair amount of, of that type of stuff. Then I've got, you know, some just hard reflectors. I've got one of the, the long, the long focus reflector. Uh, and then what else? I do have the, uh, the optical, what do they call that? That you can project uh, different gobos, cookies, different shapes and, and stuff. What do they call that? Uh, oh, like an optical, optical snoot, snoots, snoots or is that what it's yeah. called? I can't remember That's what they great. call it, but uh, actually, I, and I use that. I should know what it's called because I use it a lot. Actually, I really like it. Um, but Godox, it, it, all the you know newer, everybody makes one. I've got the Godox one. Um, but it, you just, you know, it's got a bow in its mouth, you have to attach it and then it can, you can put different cookies in and make different shapes and patterns or, you know, different, uh, obviously you can put gels on it, but just makes for an interesting background or you can put it, uh, actually, uh, as, as one of your key lights and put different patterns and shapes on the, on the model's face or, or body or whatever, which makes for interesting and just an interesting variation on a portrait. Um, a lot of times that's going to be more geared towards fashion or uh, model type stuff. Obviously, the corporate stuff, that's not really going to be particularly appropriate for. Um, but I, I do have that. And then a lot of the other stuff I have is just uh, ridiculous amount of light stands and Apple boxes. And just the stuff you would see in a normal studio, just different clips and, and ways to hang stuff or get stuff out of the way. So I recently switched over to Godox um, not too long ago, um, and I, I have to say I, I love it. It's it's uh, it's an excellent bang for the buck type of brand, you know. Especially the eighty two hundreds are phenomenal. The eighty four hundred, which I love, that's like my main key light uh, that I use in my little space, and that's plenty powerful for the space that I work in. Um, yeah, it it is really. I, I don't really feel the need to invest into anything more expensive for that because I actually find that Godox gear really reliable. Have you had any issues with that? 
The only the only thing I've had is uh, I do get some misfires every now and then, but not that often. Uh, and then sometimes the the color cast is not necessarily uh, your your white balance. You have to sort of play with that just a little bit. If if, if you're shooting something where it's really critical that you you get the color dead on, but you know just being honest, most of the stuff I do is not that critical. Um, you know, I mean, it's if if you're if you're that critical, yeah, I would need a pro photo, but. I don't do the kind of work that that's going to matter that much. Um, but in general, I, I'm, I love Godox or Godox or however people pronounce it. Uh, I think I just saw they'd come out with a new, a new trigger. That looks really nice. I don't think you've seen the new trigger um, that's replacing, what is it? The art two or whatever it's called. Um, okay. But they're obviously, um, they're obviously trying to copy the look graphically of a pro photo um when you look at the, the trigger uh the numbering the 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 font style everything looks mm -hmm. very much like the pro photo trigger oh I, um, I haven't heard of that yet but i might have to figure i might have to check that out because that's immediately interesting to it's me. supposed to be a, a, a lot uh very user friendly very more options i think you can you've got more i think more um more control, more leeway in how powerful you want the light to be. Like instead of just going in, in third stops, I think you can even go more than you know more precise than a third of a stop. I think I could be I could be wrong about that. You may we may get inundated with people going pierces. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's actually to be honest with you, that's one of the things. Um, so th if I if I would have one criticism when it comes to um, Godox size or, or or switching over to Godox from Interfit. I know Interfit is not necessarily you know a luxury brand at all, uh, but it completely worked for me. Um, but the one thing I really loved about it, and the same thing like you know the thing I like about brown color, for example, is I like I like a ten scale, you know, like a one to ten. Ten I is the most. What they're using. Yeah, ten is the full power. One is the lowest power, and then you've got you know ten degrees between level one and two you know so you've got one 1.1 1. 1, 1. 1.2 so and it makes to my metric brain my metric european brain uh that makes perfect sense you know um and it's also it's just easy because you're you know let's say for instance um you set your lights up and you just want to get a general idea you set the thing to half power well that's five simple you know and then uh it is, it's just it's just easy to set up and of course you get that um that ability to be really granular with your like you know with your 10th increments, basically, rather than thus. So that, to me, was sort of almost like a, a step backwards when I switched to Godox, you know, having to deal with thirds of stops and uh, stuff like that. Um, not that it's a, it's not a major issue. It's just my, well, you know. Check, I, I, I think that's what they've done. I think that's what I saw. Um, yeah. I saw a couple of YouTube things when Godox put out, you know, promotional YouTube videos of, of the new trigger. Uh, in fact, it may be so new. It may not even be available at stores. It may just be an announcement where it's coming. I'm not sure. Um, cool. But well, it, it, well, I will check that out. I will really check that out. Uh, definitely, I will check that out. And, and if it is out, or as soon as it becomes available, I'll definitely do a little test uh, review video on this on this channel. So if you are uh, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, remember that there's a, a YouTube channel as well where you can not only listen to our sultry voices, but see our lovely faces in full Technicolor. Um, but I will also be launching um, different kind of content on the YouTube channel as well. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to be reviewing some gear. Um, and uh, so thank you for, for for pointing me in that direction because that's definitely something I'll, I'll review 100%. Um, okay, so we talked about lighting in um, in your studio, but I also know that you're, uh, you do a lot of real estate work. Um, what kind of lighting would you typically use to light, um, let's say, you know, a hotel, like a hotel room versus, let's say, a hotel foyer, for example? Well, real estate photography and architectural photography are really are two different animals. Uh, for real estate, the realtors for the MLS, once again, I'm using all the terms that we use here in the States. They may be different over in Europe. I don't know. 
Um, but they want stuff very bright, very evenly lit. They don't want, you know, they're not going for dark and moody. They're not going for, you know, they don't want one room to be bright and, and even. And then when you see another room, see that little dark. They want everything to be bright, cheerful, happy, inviting. Like I could live there. I could raise my, my children in that home. Um, so um, I shoot, there's several different ways you can shoot real estate photography. Um, you can do HDR, which is the probably the, the simplest, quickest way. And, and, and I shot HDR for years. Uh, but if a client says, look, we've got, we've got 20 minutes to shoot this house. We got to be in and out for whatever reason Then I'll probably just shoot it HDR, just set, set my camera on a tripod, do a two stop, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll do a three shot HDR with two stops in between and then just go back and, and, and have Photoshop go into HDR mode and do that way. Um, 99% of what I shoot, I shoot. And it's the stupidest name, but it's called flambient. At least that's what I've always heard it called, flambient. Where I'll shoot an ambient shot where I get I get my um, exposure pretty pretty bright. I mean, my histogram is definitely leaning pretty heavy towards the right side. Uh, and then I'll shoot another one. I'll, I'll, I'll go about a stop under what the camera thinks is correct exposure and do a flash exposure. Or if I have a white ceiling, I'll, I'll pop an AD200 off the ceiling and light it uh, that way, and and that one will be a, a little bit dark. But when I when I uh, composite the two in Photoshop, uh, looks great. Looks great. Uh, I sometimes I'll look at that and realize, well, that one back corner might still be a little dark, so I have to go pop uh, a third exposure. We'll have to go hold the AD200 uh, near that corner. And, and light that corner, and then I can just, you know, brush brush that corner in. Um, for hotels, the hotel rooms, very similar, maybe not quite that bright and friendly, but they still want that pretty, pretty evenly lit. The difference there is for the lobby, for the bar, for the some of the amenities areas, they might want a little more more of a mood to it maybe like if it's if it's a bar they might they might be okay with some darker areas uh a little more kind of a romantic vibe possibly uh the lobbies could potentially have you know a little bit more dramatic feel to it whereas in real estate they're not going for drama at all they want everything at least at least in in my area that may be different in other areas but down here, uh, they want it pretty, pretty bright, pretty happy, pretty, pretty, you know, friendly looking. Um, but architectural stuff, you've got a lot more leeway to do. What I think it's a little bit more creative lighting. Um, but that's 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 why I really don't need the the, the twelve hundred watt light. Um, I needed it when I was shooting big ballrooms and, and big you know convention type spaces where it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a gymnasium, basically. It's a huge room. Uh, and even then, sometimes I would have to pop it in each corner to, to light the whole thing because it would be so big. Uh, but now I say now, um, and I, like I said, I used to do a fair amount of that kind of work, but when COVID hit, uh, I kind of lost a lot of my Hilton work, Hilton and Holiday Inn work. Um, would love for it to come back, Hilton and Holiday Inn, if y'all listening. Um, but I, I have the light, so I, I, I just use it now as kind of my, my key light in my studio. Um, but I, like I say, it's hardly ever above 164th power, maybe 132nd power at the most, probably, um, that I need it in here because it's, it's so powerful. Um, but it's a great light. It really is a great light. And, and that one, the, the color balance on that one is always spot on. I do love that, the color balance on that one. Um, but real estate is just, it, it's, it's a, it's a fine line between getting in and out of there quickly. Uh, cause if the homeowners got to sort of get out of the way, so you're sort of inconveniencing them and realtors don't want to sit there all day. They want to get back to what they're doing. So they want you to be fairly quick while still getting, you know, quality shots. So you've got to sort of, you got to, if you're going to do the, the lighting type 
the flambing at lighting, you sort of got to know what you're doing. You need to practice on friends' houses before you go do it because otherwise you'll spend hours, you know, and, and the realtor will be like, okay, that's enough. Let's go. We got it. We got other flakes to do. Um, and and I, I shoot, give or take, about 800 houses a year. So I've got it down where I can shoot. I can shoot a 3,000 square foot house in 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, a, you know, I can shoot a 1,500 square foot house. Like I shot today, I shot a, a, about a, 1200 square foot house i thought i was out of there in 15 minutes um now i've got to go back and edit it which will take another 20 minutes maybe whatever um but i can get in and out of the house quick just having because just repetitive just to have done it so many times um that you can you get to the point where you i can walk into a room and know what power setting my light's going to be I, I just already know i can just tell um the problem is when you get people who pay bizarre colors on the walls where you get really strange color cast or they've they've painted their ceiling like i, I shot a, I'll, he'll remain nameless but i shot an nba player's house a very high end <laughs> several three or four million dollar house he painted his, his master bedroom every wall the ceiling everything was black because he wanted Ooh. to be able to sleep all day oh my god what you know photographing that was a nightmare because what are you going to bounce the line off of? It's, you know, so I had a reflector. I was bouncing light off that, but it still looked, it just had an unnatural look to it uh, because because of that. But this, that, you know, nothing we could do about it. And the realtor understood that. I think eventually talked him into painting it a more neutral color because nobody's going to buy a house with, with all black walls and ceilings. So, um, but that, as far as real estate photography goes, uh, it's it's all about making it bright, happy, and, and clean looking. That's that's the key. What about your lens choices for uh, for real estate? Do you go all in with like tilt shit uh, tilt <laughs> tilt shit lenses tilt shift lenses? Is what I should say seventeen millimeter tilt shift. Uh, I'm a huge believer in tilt shift lenses. Um, I, I I I shot just with, with with standard kind of wide angle lenses for a long time. Uh, uh, about five or six years ago, I finally got a tilt shift, and man, I will not go back. It, they are so. And and David Bergman, uh, the great David Bergman, who has become a friend of mine, a uh, great great guy, um, kind of helped explain to me why a tilt shift lens is so good. Um, a normal lens is just just barely bigger than the sensor. The, the the diaphragm that opens up is just barely bigger than the sensor, uh, which is why on some lenses you might get a little bit yetting around around the corners on the edges. A tilt shift lens does not have that. The tilt shift lens is much much the the, the image that's coming through the lens. I don't know, I'm making this number up, but it's probably two times or three times the size of the actual sensor. So you don't get, you don't ever get any vignetting and it's crystal, just sharp focus from corner to corner because of the nature of a tilt shift lens where it is, you're, you're, you can actually keep the camera steady, but move the lens up and down. And the reason you have that is because you want your, your walls to be vertical, as we call it, real estate photography, to remain constantly dead you know 90 degrees just 90 degrees straight up and down so you can move that thing up and down and keep your vertical straight well to be able to do that they have to be able to project it such that it, it covers that the sensor on the camera um so a tilt shift lens is just noticeably sharper than any of the other lenses i've ever tried in real estate and and i i never tried it but but David was telling me, and I, I've heard other photographers will sometimes even use a tilt shift lens in portrait photography. I, but because of the nature of what a tilt shift lens is, they're always going to be, unless some technology comes along that would be amazing, they're always going to be a manual focus lens. And I, I don't, I just assume go ahead and use the, you know, uh, uh, an 85 1.2 or whatever for, for my portraits. And use the eye detection, and I'm just lazy enough that I want to use that. Uh, so I'm not sure I would would use a tilt shift lens, but you could also use tilt shift to get some special effects with your portrait photography. 
Um, there's, you know, there's different special effects things you can do where you're creating and there's terms for it, but I don't know what they are, but where everything gets a distorted reality look to it that, you know, you're getting it quote in camera, which is, which is cool. So uh, a lot of that stuff you could probably do in Photoshop now, especially with all the AI stuff that's going on, but you can do that with a tilt shift lens, but. Yeah, I'm, I only have the I have the 17 millimeter. I know they make they make probably three different uh, lens tilt shifts. I know like once they get you might know more than me, maybe 24 millimeter or that, whatever. But the 17 millimeter is perfect for real estate. Yeah, it is perfect. You don't get you know it's not wide enough that you're getting quote a fish eyed look, um, but it's wide enough that you're getting. You know, because they want to see the entire room. So it's plenty of light for that. So big yeah. believer in tilt shift. So I tell you what, tilt shift uh, lens is coming really handy also for product photography. Um, it's, you can create some, because otherwise you're very often, you know, you're in this, in this position where when you are shooting a product, because you're relatively close, um, you very often in this situation where your only option, you know, to get everything everything sharp is to use focus stacking you know um because you're shooting relatively small things um and of course using tilt shift lenses will can get you around that quite easily and you can get it you know you can adjust the angle of the lens to the product so that so that you end up getting sharpness all the way through so that can be uh that can be a really a really useful thing um you know other than that focus stacking is your best friend <laughs> so with oh, that kind of stuff you know but um, yeah, I did a, I did a, a product shoot. Um, that can be cool in landscape photography too. Sometimes, yeah, uh, I wouldn't use it for everything. But there have been a couple times when it has been an interesting option to focus stack if you really want to get, you know, you, you don't want to shoot at f twenty two because of refraction and different different reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, uh, but you do want to get the foreground, but you still want to get, you know, the mountain, which is, you know. A mile away, you want to keep everything super sharp. Focus that, and it's great for that. And of course, you know, with modern cameras like you know, relatively uh, recent, you know, Canons and Nikon's, it's so easy to do as well. It's, it's all automated. You just set up, and it does right. it all. You know, you don't really have to think very much about it. I did some focus stacking, and I shot a um, a toy car, like a scale model Ford Mustang, 1970 Ford Mustang Mac One, I think. It was amazing car. Um, and the idea was to create to create an image that could pass as a Tim Wallace automotive shot, <laughs> you know. Uh, but because you you know when you're when you're shooting a scale model, you don't really have much of a choice. The thing you know, I used a macro lens for it. Um, you know, your depth of field is is waver thin, so you're going to have to use focus stacking to actually get the whole car in focus. Um, you know, to, to basically pull that off. Um, and it's, it was so easy. I can't believe, I, can't, I just can't believe how easy that was. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, right. Wang. Well, I just do, well, there's a menu and I could do two things and it does it. Perfect. And it was it great. I mean, well. it just, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. It really works well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, re it really worked um, astonishingly well. And, um, you know, because I'm not like, I'm not a macro photographer, really. That's not really something I do very often at all. It was just for this particular, it was actually for one of the platform videos that I made. Um, and I, I thought, yeah, this is, this is cool. This is, you know, this is definitely a technique you can use more often for different things. Mm. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it works really well. So and I did some, uh, but there's also just some ideas that I had for some product photography um, where I thought, okay, I'm going to have an issue with sharpness um, throughout the image. Uh, so yeah, so that that's actually why I've been thinking about tilt shift lenses as well. So I might, I might very well just have to hire some in what, at some what point. What millimeter? What millimeter tilt shift lens do you have, or did you? Rip I don't have I, I don't have any, but I'm thinking. Um, so the ideal kind of lens probably would be somewhere around 18 mil, you know, something in that uh, for for the product shoot that I'm talking about. Um, so something that would be at 50 mil, 80 mil, something like that. You know, around about that kind of thing would be probably ideal for this. If that's even a if that's even a thing, but you know, it's just um, yeah. I guess anywhere between 
let me see, anywhere between 80 to 110 in that kind of, in that kind of region. Um, I don't, you know, I don't I'll know say, if they make a dual shift. They might. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know either. But that's my that's not my idea. That's gonna be that's gonna be a way of doing it. Because the, you know sometimes when you're when you're shooting um, a product, especially if it's at a particular angle where it it sort of it kind of tilts away from the camera, you know you're gonna you're gonna have an issue where um, where you're because of the way that you're shooting, especially with a macro lens, you know, or some or you're that close up, your depth of field is gonna be pretty you know razor thin for the lack of a better word and so you in order to get that sharpness all the way through the product um you're gonna have to adjust the angle of the the plane of the of the lens if that makes sense so tilt shift might be ideal for that but I don't know. it's something it's something i've got to experiment with um there is a company that make uh, it's like a it's like a bezel thing that you can i just forget what it's called but it's it's a pretty um, elaborate rig that allows you to to manually shift the the plane and it's, it's kind of it's fairly involved. Um, but yeah, that's just something I'm going to experiment around with. Um, so there might be I might at some point make a platypod video about exactly that. <laughs> Who knows? Once I figure it out, well, I'll do it myself. They're they're fun to play with. They're it's the the concept of it. Of, of of it is is amazing and, and they, like I say the images are just so sharp. Yeah, I mean that's this is the thing. I mean I've shot some um, some real estate, you know, in my time. Um, I've never I've never actually shot with um, a tilt shift lens. I've always used either fourteen to twenty four uh, or twenty four to seven, depending on what the you know uh, what the subject was. But um, but yeah, so that's definitely something something I want to try out at some point for sure. So cool. So, what's your plan then for the next, like for for twenty twenty four? Now that we with the start of twenty twenty four, what's your plan for twenty twenty four uh, with your with your new studio? What's your what have you got coming up next? Well, the the plan is to start. Uh, I, in fact, I just put on my Facebook and Instagram stories today. Uh, I've got I've just finished doing some promotional videos or reels um, for the new studio. Uh, uh, so that's the plan is to start getting the word out that it's, it's available, uh, and to try to get more, more work in that, that arena. Um, and then to try to get more, uh, model fashion type work. Um, there, back when I had the recording studio, we were, we worked fairly closely with a couple of the big modeling agencies here in town, uh, for, for actors who were doing voiceovers. Um, so I've still got some contacts there. So I plan on, uh, you know, once I have time to get some print collateral together, uh, drop those off, say hi, remind them who I am and say, look, there's another, there's, there's still, there are several photo studios here in town, but always good to know of another one and, and one that's probably not going to be quite as expensive as some of the, some of the larger houses are. So that, that's the plan. Uh, and then still, still, still doing real estate, still doing that. Uh, it, it definitely is what pays the bills is what, uh, I have to do just to keep, keep the roof over my head, so to speak. So, um, do that. And then, uh, well, hopefully the, you guys come up with another fun workshop to go do in some interesting place like Norway. So yeah, give me another piece to get my passport stamped. Amazing. Bob, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for uh, being the guest uh, on this week's episode of the Camera Shake Podcast. It was an absolute blast. Okay, you're the best, man. Love you, brother. Okay, folks, that's it for today. As always, it was awesome having Bob on the show, and I'm tempted to build a studio in my backyard now just to get to convince the wife. And as always, before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you'll like. Check out episode 188 with Joe Edelman, where we discuss whether the exposure triangle is still relevant in the age of mirrorless cameras. I'm sure you'll love it. If you enjoy our content, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. It really does mean the world to us. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fledged video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guests' photography in full Technicolor? 
All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Tech Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. If you're already on YouTube, though, drop us a comment, hit the like button, ring that bell, and share with your friends. Your engagement helps us reach a wider audience all over the world. Thank you for listening and watching. And remember, a new episode drops every Thursday, so mark your calendars. Until next time, keep shaking things up in the world of photography. See you next Thursday. Bye.